Well, good morning, Mr. Bud. Morning. Um, it's April 9th, and it's around 9.30 in the morning, April 9th, 2008, and we are sitting at uh, Porter Novelli in New York City, and uh, Mr. Bud has agreed to spend a little time with us and, and talk about his history and his thoughts on public relations. So let's start at the beginning and take a look at uh, how you selected a career in public relations. Um, you, you started at Carl Beyer, but I think there were some things that happened before that. Oh, yeah. um, can you talk about any previous experience that may have influenced your career path? And then while at Beyer, did you face any challenges during the tr transitions that you made from staff writer to vice chair? Because I know you were at Beyer, you left, and you went to Emhart, and then you came back to Beyer. So tell us a little bit about that whole <coughs> time of your life. Well, when you look back, you put things in a different focus than when you're doing them. Yeah. And you can see what you were doing that you didn't see when you were doing it. So I guess I was inevitably headed where I went uh, in college. I went to Hofstra, at a college, now a university. I majored in uh, political science and sociology, minored in history, uh, and then came in contact with an academic power broker of the type I'm sure you're familiar with. His name was Joseph Rochek, R-O-U-C-E-K, head of the Department of Sociology. And I'm essentially an introvert. You may not believe that, but I am. So the first two years at Hopton, which was a small school at that time, uh, was very uneventful, but I like sociology. And Rochek had a habit of singling out somebody in a class who was gay and A and making a he or her, him or her, uh, his protege, really his lackey. And he picked me, uh, he gave me no benefits, really, because I had to still participate in the class. But he pushed me into things I wouldn't normally have done on my own initiative. Uh, he wanted me to be editor of the uh, newspaper so he could get publicity. He wanted me to be president of the International Club because he thought it would be good for him, and so on and so on and so forth. And I found I didn't object to all of that. Uh, I kind of like doing different things. Mm -hmm. So I guess I was finding out that I had a little entrepreneurialism in myself that I didn't recognize. Mm -hmm. So then I went out. Uh, my first job was with something called Northeast Airlines, uh, a little feeder line from New England to the Cape and so on. It didn't amount to much. We were just really goodwill ambassadors going around calling on people to remind them of Northeast. And they didn't give two hoots about Northeast except they wanted to get to Cape Cod in the summer. And they couldn't get flights, so they were nice to me. I got bored with that. And I answered an ad in a paper uh, for a publicity job that was then called the Museum of Science and Industry, which was in 30 Rockefeller Plaza, right in the heart of that building. And it had been pop the Museum of Science and Industry had been popular at one time, but it had been stagnated. Uh, they had scientific displays, and it was really pretty awful. So the Moribund trustees hired an unemployed 20th Century Fox producer to come in and do things. And he created uh, events like an exhibition of uh, Joe Davison, J.O., uh, sculpture. But his big money maker was photographic exhibitions. And I was hired to publicize them and also to create things within uh, to make things happen. 
And I got the idea one time to bring it in a car so that models could pose in it for the photographers, the amateurs. And another friend of mine was doing freelance publicity for something called the Barbizon School of Models. So we worked out a deal that he would make these girls available if we gave them the photographs, because they all needed portfolios. Well, the only car I could get into the museum was a car called the Willys. It was like uh, a, small studio, a small crisis these days. And I found out that the agency handling Willys was Carl Beyer. So I just called, and this young guy showed up who was a sort of a staffer on the account, and his name was Joe Conley. And he was like I was. He was a bachelor, same age, and we immediately liked each other. And he was an organizer, an operator, as we would say. He said, I have to get into Carl Bark. We want to work together. I said, what is Carl Bar? It's in public relations. What the hell is that? Don't worry. So we could spend the morning talking about how I finessed my way in. But that's how I got in. I had no idea what public relations was. All I knew that it was uh, more freewheeling than any job. I, see, I turned down my father, who wanted me to go into the family publishing business. But the specialty was income, uh, tariffs, uh, custom duties, and things like that. He, he started with a 25 cents magazine, sort of like a Sagat uh, survey, half the size, and built it up into a four or 500 page uh, huge book, which the State Department bought, bought about 1,000 each year. And then he had a monthly magazine called Import and Export Bulletin. And then he had another one called Air Transportation. But it was all too boring to me. So I had to do it on my own in a different way. I suppose I disappointed him. So I get into Carl Beyer, and it was assigned to uh, the Hallmark account, which wasn't called Hallmark at that time. It was called Hall Brothers, because the founders of Hallmark were three Halls, H A W L S. And I was the youngest and certainly the cheapest person ever hired by buyer at that time. I think I got $50 a week. And buyer was with Hill and Oten, were the two top PR firms in that particular area. We're going back a long time, 60 years. Uh, they never took an account less than one year. And you paid a fee, which was handsome in those days. And, and all that entitled you to as a client is the access to the top brass of buyer. If you called once or a hundred times, it was still that. Then if you wanted to call buyer to do anything, you created a staff. And a staff could be just an account executive and a secretary for which the client paid. Or in some cases, 10, 15. Honeywell had about 25. So I was a staff writer, really a staff publicist on Hallmark. At one point in time, I complained about the difficulty of getting uh, credit for Hallmark in stories, because you had to write such and such and such made, uh, according to so-and-so at Hall Brothers, makers of Hallmark cards, and that was much too long for the media. So I got them to approve, or through the account executive, not me, got them to approve our use of the word Hallmark and not Hall Brothers. And of course, that's what it is today. And that was a lot of fun, because I dealt Mostly at Christmas time, because that meant I dealt with Grandma Moses, Norman Rockwell, Salvador Dali, uh, people like that, because they were the, the links to publicity. 
you have to, uh, there were, pre we didn't do hard news, it was soft news. I remember being invited up to Dolly's apartment. He thought I was an access to J.C. Hall, and he wanted to sell Hall another painting, and he was trying to use me as a lever. But I, I remember Grandma Moses, she was a wily old gal, handled by a real canny Austrian agent. We go up to her house, and in the living room, along the wall, there's all these pieces of plywood with green and white, grass and sky. She was a one-man production machine. She would do, and this, this Austrian uh, mountebank who was her agent would really peddle that stuff. You know. she, she was great. And a fraud, she was in uh, Eagle Bridge, New York. And across the way in Vermont was Norma Rockwell. And our access to, or my access to them, was because at Christmas time, Hall, uh, who always had an eye for quality, uh, had the rights to their paintings for Christmas cards. And that was it. So that was my early career. Uh, after that, I worked on Honeywell, which was then called, if you can believe it, the Minneapolis Heat Regulator Company. But the product was Honeywell. So in the course of the evolution, uh, they changed their name to Honeywell. And I guess I did publicity work, well, maybe half a dozen years or more and enjoyed it. But I was totally intimidated when I got in the bar and found out who I was with. I was surrounded by former editors, uh, anchors, uh, magazine writers, byline authors. And I said, dear God, they're going to get me sooner or later. They call me upstairs and say, young man, we're sorry, but we made a mistake. <laughs> so every Friday, and I remember this vividly, and it has a bearing on the rest of my life, every Friday I didn't get a call. I said I got another week. But what that did was, I was not a good writer, believe me, absolutely not. Bayer had at that time, and I don't think it's ever been duplicated, even today, an editor who was a former newsman, came from Indiana, and he had absolute power to reject, well, every story had to go through him. He couldn't do it today because they're too big, but he had the absolute power to reject anything for lack of news, lack of interest, poor spelling, poor writing, whatever, and there was no appeal. And the worst thing you could say to him was, well, that's the way the client wants it, and then you were dead in the water. Because I thought I was in there on a pass, I wrote and rewrote and rewrote and rewrote. Little stories, long stories. And he took a shine to me, I guess, because I showed so much eagerness, and so he helped me. But going beyond what is asked became a habit. And that's really what I've done ever since. You know, uh, I'm accused of being against the status quo, which I am, conventional wisdom, which I am. And what I liked then about the, the, the business, and I was happiest to climb doing publicity, I loved the contest with the editors, who, in those days, really had it in for PR people because they thought we got more money than they did, which is true, not me, but mm -hmm. the senior people. Uh, and it was sort of like selling out. And what you had to do was to give them something that was more interesting and better or as well written as they would do it to substitute for, for what they had written and for which they're getting paid. So it was a daily contest and you know, it wasn't a boring minute and I enjoyed it immensely. And as I look back, 
I probably had more fun and more enjoyment and satisfaction in those days doing just plain publicity. And I publicized over my somewhat long career. Greeting cards, Bibles, rivets, warplanes, thermostats. I mean, the most prosaic product you can think of. But I did it, and we did it successfully, and I enjoyed it. So then I get it bar. And over the time, I won. We had a, a internal competition on writing awards, and I made it a point to win as many as I could. And I kind of liked that because I was competing against really good people, who probably didn't pay much attention to it, but I did. Finally, I became an accounts uh, supervisor. We were very thin on titles, not today, not in this global baloney. Uh, and I had staff under me who were writers. Then I became a senior, they called it a senior counselor. And Bayard changed over the years from a meritocracy to a bureaucracy, and I didn't like that. And I didn't agree with the then chief executive, and I had been dealing with uh, a small company in Connecticut uh, called Emhart, E-M-H-A-R-T. Basically what I was doing was just going up there maybe a couple times a year to help them with the annual report, the quarterly reports, and do an occasional analyst meeting. Emhart itself became a white knight for a huge English company called British United. And British United uh, was a Goliath that covered the world with every kind of conceivable machinery to make shoes. But they had been accused and indicted for a monopoly, and in the process of adjusting to that, they made a lot of foolish and ill thought out acquisitions and became virtually bankrupt in the United States although they were profitable abroad. And they were attacked by an unwholesome raider, and they turned to Emhart, which they had known about. They're sort of their kind of people. So Emhart bought them. Now Emhart, yet a British United called then USM, was two-thirds larger than Emhart, but Emhart bought them. And in the process, uh, I said to uh, the, the then chairman of Emhart, who I was, said I was seeing occasionally, and your life is going to change. You no longer can get by with this uh, ad hoc PR operation. You're going to have to do more. You're going to be asked questions when you don't want to be asked. Uh, you're a big company now. You're a multinational. Uh, you have problems. Half of your shareholders are abroad who are bilingual, your people only read the Hartford Current. Uh, half your employees are abroad. So he said, well, what do I do about it? Well, I said, you can do several things. You can uh, hire a PR person full time, which I was now. You can promote someone from within, which you can't because you don't have anybody, or maybe I might do it. He says, I was waiting, <laughs> waiting for you to say that. So I, as I said, I got bored and uninterested in Cobb at that time. So I moved. My wife said, it's a bad, bad decision. You're too impatient to get along in the corporate world. And there were a couple of occasions she was right. But, so I created whatever constituted public relations there. They, they didn't know what it was any more than most CEOs do today. So I wrote my own job description, and I knew the people pretty well. There were a bunch of penny-pension Yankees. So my job description, which they thought was admirable, was Mr. Budd will conduct public relations and do such other duties at requ 
requested by the chairman. Now, that may not mean much to you, but what it did was give me total elbow room. I could interpret what I was doing any way I damn pleased because that had no restrictions. And it worked. Uh, very small staff. Created a newspaper, which I insist was not a house organ because we never interviewed the CEO. We didn't make any pleas. If we talked to him, it was on a story. It was run by a former newsman. Uh, we had editorial cartoonists outside, outside photographers. Uh, it was in English, even though we had 30 languages abroad. Uh, it had high credibility. I have since told younger colleagues that it was a, uh, a lever that I used to open up the company, because they understood the newspaper. They understand public relations. So I said, we've got to put it in the newspaper. And they would reluctantly agree to something they would never have done if I said we had, it would be good for the public relations process. They just they never understood that. Uh, let me see what happened then next. It, it, well, I was kicked out at 65 because senior officers had to retire at that age came back briefly to the PR business just about after 11 years. I felt like Rip Van Winkle. They hadn't improved, it just got bigger, but they were still doing the same damn things. So I endured that for a while, then I decided that I didn't like it. I created my own uh, little operation based on three premises. One, I thought overhead was penalizing public relations, they could charge you that much. Uh, two, I thought their arrogance in thinking that they had a uh, solution to every problem was wrong. I think, I think of a, a good public relations executive as a quarterback. He's not the whole damn team. And also, they were also terribly left brain oriented. No right brain. So, so that's what I did. And I have been doing it ever since.